Our scripture passage for today is a continuation from last week's passage. It's Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. Hear this good news. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus returned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come to his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So last week, if you recall, Jesus asked the question, who do people say I am? And the disciples gave him the answers, you know, Elijah, Jeremiah, great prophet. But then he asked the question, who do you say I am? And Peter blurts out, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus celebrated Peter, Peter's answer by saying, "My Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. It wasn't ego that revealed this to you, but rather the spirit within you. And you are the rock and the foundation of my church, and not even the gates of Hades can prevail against it. So that's where we were last week. And now we find Jesus going on to explain to his disciples, as Messiah, what his destiny is and how he's going to have to fulfill it. When he does, the passage says, Peter rebuked him. Now, The word rebuke in the Greek means to censure severely, to admonish sharply. This wasn't just a matter of, Jesus, don't you want to think this through? Or, you know, don't talk like that. No, Peter was in his face. It's like wagging your finger in the face. You will not do this. I remember there was a TV show on years ago called My Two Dads. And the comedian Paul Reiser was a part of the cast. And the idea was that there was a young girl whose father could have been Paul Reiser's character or another character. And the girl's mother died and her wish is that the two men would help raise the child together. All right? So that's the premise of the sitcom. There was one point in, this, in one of the sit- stories, episodes, where Paul Reiser's character was rebuking and, and, and chiding his, his, his daughter. And as he was talking to her, he says, and listen here, young lady, you will never, and then he looked at his finger and he says, when did I get my father's finger? Right? So this is the kind of event that we have going on with Peter and Jesus. Peter is in Jesus' face. Peter is wagging his finger. Peter is admonishing him and censuring him severely. But notice what happens in return. Jesus rebukes Peter just as severely as Peter had rebuked Jesus. And why does Jesus do this? I want you to hold on to that question for a little while. Just think about that as I continue on with our lesson for today. Why is Jesus' response to Peter just as harsh as what Peter did to Jesus? Jesus goes on to say to Peter, you are a Satan or a Satan. And thankfully, Matthew goes on to to define what that means. It does not mean uh, uh, some mythical creature that's red with horns on its head and a pointed tail and a pitchfork. A Satan is simply a stumbling block. Peter, at this point in time for Jesus, had become a stumbling block. And why? Why? Look, I look at it this way. 
it is our job to figure out who we truly are. And as we become more conscious about who we really are, and as we start to somehow transcend all the ways other people around us have tried to define us and mold us and make us into an image they need us to be, as we transcend those definitions and those, those, uh, and those molds, then when we discover who we truly are, we typically also find a clearer picture of what kind of purpose we are to serve in this world. And that is our job. That's our job. No one can do that for us. We have to take the time to do the inner work and to do the homework and to do the study, to do the reflection, to do trial and error things, to discover who am I. I also, once we do discover who we are and when we reveal to those who are closest to us what it is we want to do, don't be surprised that those closest to you will get in your way. Why did they do this? I don't know, maybe a control issue. I have no idea. It can't um, be in the mind of everyone. But oftentimes, I believe it's for this reason. Sometimes when we share what it is, our passion is, and what we want to do, and how we want to fulfill our life, those who are closest to us see that maybe taking this path doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, it's going to create hardship and pain and suffering in your life. And they try to dissuade us out of a sense of love and relationship. But regardless of those whom we love and how much they love us, when we are clear about our purpose in this life and in this world, it is up to us to fulfill it no matter what. I remember when I felt the call to ministry. I had just started college. After I thought about it and talked to my parents about this feeling that I had, it was a very intuitive feeling experience, I went and talked to my pastor. And my pastor told me this. He said, go ahead and finish your four-year degree at UCF. And during these four years, if you find any other career that you feel fulfills you and you feel happy in, then do that. Because ministry is a very, very different, difficult profession. So after those years at UCF, I graduated with my dis business degree, and at the end of that period of time, I knew that I still needed to fulfill this call that I felt I had to be a pastor of a church. And now I'm off to seminary. One of my biggest supporters during that time, when he learned that I was going to a mainline seminary, uh, an institution of higher learning, he got in my face and admonished me like fervently, like spit coming out of his mouth. And he says, don't you let those people change you. And I remember thinking that was so odd at that moment in time. Why would he say this to me? If, if I'm going to go on this journey and go to seminary and I don't let anybody change me, then why should I waste a seminary in my own time? But as I read the story about Peter and Jesus, that personal experience comes to my mind. Don't you let them change you. Well, they did change me, and they changed me for the better. I see also in this passage is an incredible indicator about how human Jesus was. Going back to the question earlier, how is it that Peter became such a stumbling block to Jesus? Why is it that Jesus' response to him was just as intense? I've thought about this question for many years. And the conclusion that I have come to is this. Peter almost persuaded him not to do what he wanted to do. There's another case in point where Jesus was almost persuaded not to fulfill his destiny. And that was on Gethsemane. When he brought Peter, James, and John, his closest disciples, and they asked them to pray for him and watch while he prayed, they fell asleep. Jesus prayed, Father, if there's any other way for me to fulfill this, please take this cup from me. And he heard nothing but silence. And at the end of his searching, he says, your will, not mine. So even right before he was arrested, Jesus was questioning whether or not he still needed to do this. Last Wednesday, 
in our Windermere University seminar, What Do You Believe?, we discussed the idea of original sin. Now, in my former denomination, they were experts in sin. I, I knew all this. We all knew everything. We got a sermon about sin every week, all, all the time. We got a sermons about sins, about drinking and smoking and dancing, going to R-rated movies. You know, there is always a whole lovely list of sins that we could not commit or should not commit if we're truly followers of Jesus. So I had a really good sense of a sin. But there's this whole concept in Christian theology over the millennia of original sin. And it happened in the Garden of Eden. And then somehow that morphed into this idea that original sin is based on sex. So it was Adam and Eve having sex that caused humanity to fall. And from then on, all humanity is just, uh, they're, they're horrible creatures. And they're, they're born in utter sin. And only an animal blood sacrifice can, can save us, right? And so Jesus became the, the Lamb of God. And his blood poured over us, saves us from our sin that we were born into. Well, if I don't hold that position. I don't believe in it at all, even though it's what I inherited and was given most of my upbringing. But whenever you hold that particular point of view, then it morphs into another thing. Well, if sex is the reason for sin and we're all born into sex because, uh, into sin because our parents created us, uh, then how could Jesus be born into sin? So we need to have a virgin birth. So then you have this whole doctrine about how somehow Mary conceived while she was a virgin, and even after Jesus was born, she remained a virgin for the rest of her life, even though Jesus had brothers and sisters. Well, then you start going into other explanations of how that could be. So you start making up stuff that's not actually in the Bible. Over the years, and in my previous tradition, it seemed to me that the idea of sin always came down to a sense of human immorality. And depending on the religious tradition or culture that you have, that you grew up into, often to define what those sins were. I'll give you an example. When I discovered that sin was a regional thing. Between Sunday school and worship, the deacons of my f church I was growing up in, who were like church leaders, it's like a board, the, the deacons, most of them were smokers, so they would stand between the education building and the sanctuary and they'd all have a cigarette before worship. And we'd get a little mini sermon about the sins and the evils of smoking. I went to seminary at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina, where tobacco built most of all the big institutions in the state. Winston-Salem, Duke University, all of these institutions tobacco helped to build. So we had a joke when we were in seminary, <coughs> Southwestern Seminary in Dallas-Fort Worth was considered the most conservative of the seminaries we had in, in the SBC, and so it was like smoking is prohibited there. Louisville, Kentucky is where Southern Seminary is. And it was the oldest of our seminaries, but um, it was tolerated because there's a tobacco influence in Kentucky as well. And the joke in North Carolina, where tobacco is a huge industry, it was the, you know, smoking is a prerequisite. Everybody has to smoke. So that's when I realized that, well, if you live in Florida, smoking is a sin. If you live in North Carolina, it is not. All right? So sin typically is implies some kind of human immor uh, immorality. What we see in the gospel stories is that Jesus was not a moralist. Now, the Pharisees were. They were the religious fundamentalists of Jesus' day, and they were all about you breaking the rules and you sinning. And they didn't see Jesus as the Messiah, as God's chosen one. They didn't see him as this remarkable human being who could do these miraculous things. All they knew about him is that he broke the Sabbath laws, he ate and he drank with prostitute, tax collectors, and sinners. So they just saw him just as another one of the big sinners of the world around him. But the word sin in the Gospels is a Greek word that was used in archery. It's harmartia. It means missing the mark. And as I started to learn what that meant, it started to change and shape the way that I see sin, right? 
Sin is any thought, belief system, or activity that I involved in that create a stumbling block for me to fulfill the purpose in which I came to this earth to fulfill. That, for me, is what sin is. What are the stumbling blocks? Now, as I reflected on this more, it started to realize that what is the greatest sin? And this is where I have come. And here again, this is my journey. These are my conclusions. I never impose my beliefs on anybody. But it seems to me the greatest sin we can commit as human beings is to go through a whole life without ever doing the inner work and knowing who we truly are. And if we don't know who we truly are, we're probably not doing the things to fulfill our destiny on this earth. In fact, we might be living lives that someone else had planned for us. And for whatever reason, that seemed okay, and we did it anyway. I think another great sin is this. To become aware who we really are, to be connected to what our deepest passions are, to have a good sense of what we want to do in this life, but we choose not to. We choose to allow people who are close to us to keep us from doing that. We choose to allow other people to define us. And the stumbling blocks, the great satans in our life, not only are people who try to prevent us from, uh, from doing what we're called to do and created to do, but also I think it has to do with the stumbling blocks inside of our mind. Many of us are afraid to step out and to take that leap of faith. Many of us are afraid to go to that place as we're going on this inward journey of self-discovery. And I find that those who choose not to, often it, it is based in their fears. I'll give you an example. It has not happened too many times in over the years that I have counseled people. But any person that I've ever counseled for a period of time, they come to a fork in the road. And it's this moment of decision. Either I go further in this journey of self-discovery or I stop right here and don't take any new action and create any change in my life at all. When I ask them the question, why are you afraid of taking this step into a deeper self-discovery, the responses have always been the same. I'm afraid of what I might find there. Other responses have been the misery that I live in, the unhappiness that I feel is an unhappiness and misery that I know. I can manage it. I've been doing it for years. But to step out of that and try something completely different that's foreign to me, I would rather stay where I am than take that risk. Personally, I think that's very sad. And just for any of you who may be listening, who you kind of come to that crossroad in your life, I can promise you from personal experience and those who have taken the road less traveled, who have gone down that journey of self-discovery, I promise you, when you take that path, you will not be disappointed, but rather you will be empowered and you will, be, uh, uh, you, you will have a sense of, of purpose and being in the world that you never knew before. Why do we allow others to take our power away? Why do we give our power away to thoughts and beliefs and to fears? The Bible is full of stories where the angels and Jesus and God are saying to the people as they're trying to lead them into a new direction, fear not, fear not, don't be afraid, fear not. Please do not allow your fears to keep you from fulfilling your greatest self. So what are the stumbling blocks that get in your way? What are they? You know what they are. There have been times in your life where you thought, you know what, I think it's now. Time, it's time for me to launch now. And something happens and you choose not to. And it happens over and over again. What are the stumbling blocks? Are they worth your life? Are they worth your soul? Jesus goes on to say that those who choose to save their life, and the word save in this context is the same Greek word sozo, which means to be made complete, to become whole, to become liberated. Those who choose to save their own life will lose it. 
the word life in this context means breath of life. Breath, spirit. You choose to give your breath away. However, those who lose their life for Christ's sake will find it. Then Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. Now, those who lose their life, what I see that in this context is this. Typically, we grow up in our families and our culture. People have defined us. And even though it doesn't really fit, we know that we really want to do something else. We choose to stay there. And we build a life around this experience. Something tragic happens. And now we know that our life will never be like it was before. And we grieve and we mourn that. So to lose our life, to find it, I understand that to mean... We choose to let go of that that is not really us and to take that journey of clarity and purpose. And Jesus says, what is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? What can you give in exchange for your soul? What is What good is it to gain the whole world? You can be in a life and in a profession that provides everything that you want and more, but you're unhappy. Why? If you're unhappy, then do the inner work. Get the help that you need to discover why you're unhappy. Henry David Thoreau, in his classic book, Walden, once wrote, The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. They go to the grave with that song still in them that they never took the risk to sing. Also, many of us find ourselves in a rut, and we have a hard time getting out of it. And sometimes we've been in that rut for so long, it just seems normal. And we've become numb, right? Ellen Glasgow wants to find a rut as this. The only difference between a rut and a grave are the dimensions. So get out of the rut. And if you find yourself in a rut, then what are your stumbling blocks to get out? And are you living a life of quiet desperation? If so, why? Why do you choose to do that? Why do you give your power away to others or tradition or culture or family expectations, whatever the stumbling block is? Why do you give your power away? One of the things that I see in Jesus and what he has done for me is this. Reading, studying, Jesus has taught me about empowerment. Jesus knew who he was. He knew what he had to do. And even moments in his ministry and his earthly life and in his humanity, there were times he was tempted not to follow through. But he would not allow that to happen because for him, his life And the meaning of life and the fulfillment of life was for him to do what he needed to do, even if it's in the face of a cross. And that is his message to me, and that is my message to you to consider. The worst thing that we can do to ourselves, the world around us, is to not be the person we were created to be. There was a wonderful movie that came out years ago, I think around 2013, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. That's right. Look it up if you haven't watched it. The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And you have a guy who was very shy. He was very um, uh, uh, introverted. And he would often find himself in these fantasies in his mind, but he would never go out on a limb and fulfill those fantasies himself until later on in the movie. And he starts on this incredible journey. 
and he discovers who he is. It's a wonderful story, and it's a beautiful illustration of what I'm talking about here. One of my favorite persons in history is Nelson Mandela. And I remember seeing an interview with him, and the, and the journalist asked him, when you were arrested and when you were put in prison, what was the first thought in your mind? And Nelson Mandela responded, I won. And the journalist was kind of taken aback by that. How, how can you say that? How can you say that you won? You were in prison for 26 years. Nelson Mandela replied, they put me in prison. I become a leader of a cause. They kill me. I become a martyr for a cause. When they let me out, I can fulfill my purpose and the cause. I think that's a beautiful example of what I see Jesus teaching us in this passage. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Finding life, finding the breath of life, not just existing, not living in quiet desperation, but finding your life, finding your identity, discovering your purpose, and then fulfilling it no matter what the cost. There's one of my favorite quotes that's attributed to Nelson Mandela. And hear this out. Just right now, just, just listen. Hear this. He reportedly said, Our deepest fear is not that we are weak. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God, and your playing small does not serve the world. As we are liberated, sozo, saved, as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So, my friends, be powerful, be beautiful, be gorgeous, be fabulous, for you are a child of God, and the world needs to see who you are so you can be a part of liberating others. Let the stumbling blocks go. They serve our rationalizations and our justifications for living small and give us excuses for not trying. So I want to end today's lesson by sharing the quote with you one more time because I believe there is so much truth. Our deepest fear is not that we are weak. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant and gorgeous and talented or fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So what I see in the stories of Jesus and what I hear in the quote from Nelson Mandela and what I know about my own journey and what I have studied and learned about other people's journeys is that when we allow the stumbling block of fear to get out of the way, we become more than we ever imagined. So be those glorious, beautiful, talented, powerful people. Let us all choose and be committed to become the beautiful, gorgeous, challenging, talented, and empowered people that God created us to be, not only for our sake, but for the world all around us. Thus ends the lesson. Go with peace and purpose. Amen.